There we go. I think we should be recording. Uh, I can't, let's see, can I tell? So I think I can see, uh, well, so what I was saying is, well, first of all, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to have you on the call. Appreciate it. Uh, welcome to the Healthcare Special Interest Group. Uh, we were just talking uh, just a little earlier about uh, sort of the stability of, of the Zoom product. Um, I, I, at the moment, cannot for some reason see participants. I could just tell uh, in my participants dialogue that I see six folks on the call, but I can't see who you are uh, for some strange reason. Maybe there's some level of security baked into this. I, I honestly don't know. But uh, uh, so just offhand, if you are uh, just dialing in, please just announce yourself so I know uh, who's on the call. I know Alicia's on the call and I know Jim's on the call. Um, anyone else? Uh, just, yeah, Rich, just... this is Ravisha as well. Oh, good. That, that's who and I was if hoping I can for. See the, I can see the list of uh, participants. I don't know why you are not able to, though. Yeah, it, it, we were just talking. It, I, this, the, uh, so I, I run on Linux, and so um, it, it could well oh. be that the Linux client uh, some, for some reason lags. But uh, it always seems to – they have a very tight cycle for uh, releases, and uh, their, their testing uh, uh, doesn't seem to be very uh, specific. But anyway – Good to have you on the call, Ravish. Uh, you're probably the key person that I want to make sure is on the call. Um, so uh, w before we sort of jump into things, and we'll do, we'll do introductions in just a moment, uh, I do want to mention that this is a recorded event. Um, and as a result, we do have an antitrust slide I want to remind everyone of. It's up on the screen right now. Uh, please read through it. There's a URL for details specifically about our antitrust policy. Oh, look, and I can't seem to, oh, there we go. That's very strange very laggy uh, highlighting anyway. Um, and so you please use that URL for any, uh, any details. Uh, the upshot is uh, please don't share any IP or anything that otherwise uh, you would consider important and valuable to your organization. Uh, in short, just be a good person. So that's our antitrust policy. Um, so let's swing back over to introductions. And again, apologies, I can't see anyone on participants list. I just see that there are nine folks on the call. Uh, and I know Alicia is on the call and Jim's on the call and Ravish as well. If you are new, uh, let me, I'll just start by saying, if you're new and you would like to introduce yourself, please, uh, please uh, unmute yourself and make an introduction. Tell us a little bit about where you're calling from and, and what you do. Hi, my name is Kent. I work for Ravish in the PSF group. I write the fabric code. For, uh, that sounds like Kent Lau. It is very good. Oh. Nice one, Rich. <laughs> I'm using. <laughs> good to good to have good you. Good catch. I was going to say yeah. Good. I was going to say good to see you, but good to hear hear from you. So <laughs> nice one. Thanks for and you're uh, calling out of Hong Kong, if I recall. I am. Yes, it's 10 p.m. Oh, very good. Uh, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, anyone else on the call? I want to make introductions. Hi, my name is uh, uh, Padmanabh Bhatta. Uh, I'm also part of the uh, payer subgroup. Um, I'm based uh, here in the US. Um, I work out of the Atlanta area. Um, I'm part of a company uh, called uh, Moksha Technologies. Uh, we have um, uh, several uh, solutions you know, uh, catering to the healthcare uh, as well as the uh, broader um, IT. Uh, services and products as well. Uh, nice to be here. Oh, very good. Uh, and uh, I also, I just got a, a note here in chat from uh, Jayakar. Uh, Jayakar, did you want to introduce yourself? I'm Jayakar from Medicon. That we are working on a real time digital healthcare system. That is a, a, a hyperledger uh, uh, infrastructure uh, backend. Uh, Excellent, and, and I'm ha having a little bit of a hard time hearing from you, but uh, I, Jayakar, I, I believe uh, several months ago you, you presented uh, to the group during the COVID virus uh, sort of focus on special topics. Yeah, same thing I'm working on. Uh, excellent, it's, a, it's a one and the same. Well, good to have you on the call. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, anyone else on the call want to introduce yourself? Alrighty. Okay. Well, as a reminder, uh, and I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, and again, I just simply cannot see who the participants are on the call today. Uh, if you are interested in uh, getting involved uh, in the organization and, and maybe sharing your, your information with us, we do have a membership directory. Uh, and I'll just share that now. Uh, and it is uh, easy, uh, pretty easy to straightforward to get your uh, name and information up on here. And this is a great opportunity to, to sort of connect with others within the community here. 
Uh, what you'll need to do is get yourself an LF ID, Linux Foundation ID. It's, it's, uh, it's free and it's just simply a way to log into the system so you can edit this page. Uh, and then ideally you would just uh, jump in, add a, add a new line and, and go ahead and add your uh, contact information. Uh, and again, we've had some really good experiences with people sharing their information for the sake of uh, sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, collaboration and, uh, and certainly doing other work as it relates to Hyperledger. So, uh, so that's available. Um, otherwise, uh, well, well, let's let's go ahead and get into community announcements. Uh, does any anyone uh, have anything that they'd like to share uh, as it relates to blockchain uh, technologies in the healthcare space? Okay. Uh, so, and I, I don't have anything offhand, although I, I will tell you that uh, the Linux Foundation is uh, hosting their event uh, and, oh gosh, I'd have to dig that information up, but that in, that's coming up soon. Uh, I should probably, I'll, 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 I'll sort of post this after the fact uh, up, on the, up on the wiki page here. Uh, it's not necessarily healthcare related. In fact, I think the agenda didn't, I didn't at least didn't see any initial uh, topics as they relate to healthcare. Uh, but uh, but that conference is coming up. It's a virtual conference, of course, and it will be happening, I believe, in the next month or two. Okay, uh, so without any further ado, then I'm going to hand over to uh, uh, to Ravish. Uh, so Ravish is uh, and and we've had Ravish uh, talk before about his uh, company uh, Jogat uh, or Jogat, I think. Um, and, uh, and today we're going to actually have him uh, speak on behalf of the payer subgroup. He chairs that subgroup. Uh, they're doing some tremendous uh, work right now. And, uh, and uh, it's great to hear that um, that work uh, has just recently been approved for inclusion in the Hyperledger Labs uh, incubator program. Um, and uh, their project is called the Modern Pharmacy Management Project. And so, uh, so Ravish, did you want to uh, take over? I'll stop sharing. Did you want to sure. share your screen? Or do you want to yeah, yeah. to? Okay, let me, I, let me. I will have to share my screen. Okay, let me stop sharing here. Oops. And uh, let's see. Well, that's mighty odd. Are, am I sharing right now? Can you see my screen? Uh, I can see your screen. Uh, oh. But when I try to oh, share, there, it there, says. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Go for it. Let me share my screen. Give me one second. Oh, and I stopped sharing and now I can see participants. So <laughs> good morning, everyone, or good day. Oh, I feel so much better now that I can see everyone. Uh, so good morning. Well, as Ravish is getting set up, good morning to Jonathan and Wendy. <laughs> it's so much nicer to see folks. <laughs> yes, good morning. Happy Hi. Friday to everyone. <laughs> Hi, Wendy, how are you? And hello, Jonathan. All right, let me share my screen if I can. All right, I hope you guys can see, see my screen. Looks great. Okay. It's out of our way. Okay. Um, Rich, thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to share what we are working on. Uh, again, the, uh, I, I just want to qualify. This is, as you as we go through the information, there are a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, we are just beginning. And the idea is to start, um, you know, talking about in simple terms and start adding complications or, or I would say features as we go forward. Um, I do want to warn everyone that if you ask us, uh, uh, there are already unanswered questions. So anyone is you know, free to jump in, you know, talk about it. But at the same time, we would also need, if you have any insight, do share with us. That would be great. Uh, obviously, I mean, the subject matter expertise is, is the most critical you know, piece as we start bringing these business models together with um, you know, blockchain solutions. And all the times, things are not very clear as such. So just, um, you know, Let's go through this with an open mind. And we are actually looking for any feedback that you have to refine this and this process will continue. So um, let's get started. Um, as a pair subgroup, we have a few key uh, attendees, which are regular, obviously. And then there are a lot of people who join, you know, come and go. 
Um, I have mentioned the names who have actively worked on this um, uh, presentation as well as uh, who are working on this uh, lab uh, as Rich talked about. We meet every Friday 1 p.m. Oh, sorry, every other Friday 1 p.m. to uh, 2 p.m. Um, and we are, uh, we are meeting every other Friday, um, not the Friday when the SIG meeting happens, it's the following Friday actually. So our next meeting is going to be next week, July 3rd, 2020. And everyone is free to join. There is no set criteria, nothing. I mean, it's a Linux Foundation open forum. All the meetings get recorded and everyone is free to contribute. There is a wiki page that we have, um, you know, just under the, I'll, I'll go through that towards the end, uh, just to give you guys a quick overview of that. Um, so we have Ankit Jain, he's one of the team members, Kent Lau, we, he's, uh, Kent, you are on the call. PSB, uh, Padmana Bhatta, he's on the call as well. And myself, Ravish Devan. Uh, you know, Kent, Ankit, or uh, if you're there, if you want to say a quick word, yeah, I want to thank Ravish for his leadership and for helping us bring this group together to uh, formulate this use case demo. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. PSB or Ankit, if you guys are on. Yeah, I think uh, you know, uh, we are very excited. I think uh, even uh, with a uh, uh, small set of uh, constant members and a lot of, you know, uh, in between infusion from an uh, inf infusion of new ideas, you know, from others, we are having like a constant progress on uh, some of the um, ideas we are building on uh, on this, and we are excited about that. Cool. I'll quickly get going. So let's quickly talk about the current state of prescription, prescription management, and fraud. So if you look at across the healthcare system, there is a lot of cost when it comes to prescription. In fact, every health payer is constantly working on how to manage the fraud and how to manage the prescription fraud. Uh, I'll show you some stats also uh, as we go through this. And this is a significant uh, one, I would say public uh, health crisis also uh, because of the behavioral issues that we get. Um, a lot of people try to game the system. If they are addicted, they will go, you know, multiple doctor shopping, you know, same prescription being filled multiple times, um, you know, and, and fraud can happen from various directions. It can happen from a member perspective. It can happen from a uh, provider perspective. It can happen from a, you know, a pharmacy perspective. So, I mean, there are all sorts of examples. If you find automatic refilling, if I am a pharmacy, a pharmacy and I see your prescription is 90 days and there is a, a uh, refill required every month, I might fill your prescription and not, you may not come and pick it up, right? And I can build the, build the uh, pair for that. Very difficult to catch some of these issues, um, you know, uh, in that sense. Phantom prescriptions, uh, you know, there is, there is no prescription, it is being forged. The, the key is member who, who on behalf of him, these transactions or her, these transactions are going on and the member may not even be aware. If you are a pharmacy and you fill my prescription without me knowing it, until as I log into my payer claim system and see that claim, which you know rarely happens. Uh, I'm sure you all have healthcare in, in, in US and how many times have you logged in and validated, or oh, you know what, my prescription transactions are ac ac absolutely accurate. It doesn't happen. And you only log in when you have an issue, your bill is not being paid, other than that, as long as I am not being charged, you know, I'm, I don't care. That's unfortunately, that's how the system works today. And there is a huge market for diverting legal prescriptions, meaning I have health insurance. I go, you know, get these um, you know, expensive medications covered by my, my, my plan, but then, then I sell it for, for financial gains, you know, at a, uh, at a lower cost than what you will get in the market. I mean, there is, there is such a big, you know, uh, fraud happening in that um, you know, area as well. And these are just simple examples that we can understand. There are a number of other ways these can happen. But the key is when that happens and when pair dollars go out, it always gets logged against a particular member. So the idea is going to be how can we 
structure a system wherein some of these things can be looked at in in a way wherein i can record what is going on i can manage the consent if somebody is filling a prescription on my behalf for me i should know it um whether i go there or not i should know it so some of those things we have tried to systematically address with our use case and again this is a complicated uh, you know uh, scenario so we have not covered everything we will slowly add layers to it as we progress uh, just to give you a scale of when we say prescription drugs what is the market place annually filled prescription in united states exceeds 3 billion dollar if the fraud is just 1% we are talking about 3 billion dollars 300 billion dollars of approximate annual prescription drugs just imagine 1% fraud itself is 3 billion dollars i am confident it's much more than 1% so just giving you a scale of what we are dealing with here so uh, these are some interesting facts i, I just wanted to share uh, just a quick big breakdown of prescription drug fraud by type you know 13% identity theft someone may steal my identity go get a prescription filled pain medication you know opioids i mean there are so many such things right forged prescription 11% 9% duplicate meaning i can get the same prescription filled at two different pharmacies for example i my doctor gave me a pain medication and i am addicted i go fill it one pharmacy call the doctor can you send it to this other pharmacy that i need to go and pick i may not be able to go to the one that you regularly send that's called you know uh, ability to to get this filled you know from various now payer does not know until the claim comes in that's another after after the after the process that has happened so whenever these frauds are happening in healthcare payer is actually Uh, you know it is very difficult to catch in the beginning so payer is always reacting to it and the dollar gone out is not the dollar coming in hi can i request if you are not talking put yourself on mute please thank you um and then there is 64% of drug seeking behavior addictions i mean this is this is just a example of what we are dealing with when we talk about the pharmacy Uh, you know, or the prescription fraud, and there is a link at the bottom from BCBS. You can go, you know, check that out as well. Prescription drug fraud by region, uh, and this is something I just wanted to share. Um, you know, interesting. You will see the southern um, part of the of the US has forty eight percent of this. The reason being is some of the laws to own a pharmacy and uh, you know for a pharmacy technician and all those are a little. you know i i don't want to say uh, simpler or linear but it is easy to get that and hence you see the concentration you know as much as 40% from the south itself you know in that area i i know about florida i mean it is like two or three weeks process to get that so just something to be aware of uh what kind of issues that we are dealing with when we talk about the pharmacy management and and thinking about leveraging blockchain what you are about to impact is the industry that is dealing with 300 billion dollars in drugs a year significant uh, impact can be created there um as i shared all the solutions till date are analysis based after the fact um you know especially in healthcare if you go visit a doctor and doctor sends a claim payer knows after you have availed the services to by virtue of you know that claim coming in now there is a very good possibility some may uh, uh, your physician does a, a a prior approval for certain things or your eligibility checks before you come in but those eligibility check is not a, a, a you know a expense that has happened but you may go there or may not go there after eligibility check but if you go there pair knows after the fact that event happened now if it is a fraud or if it is a genuine event they don't know till they go through you know heavy analytics to find out the behavior and issues and sometimes with the provider or with the 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 pharmacy so on and so forth and you can you can search through there are so many um 
you know uh, i would say uh, legal cases around you know starting from all sorts of organizations intentionally and unintentional um, issues and errors uh, and 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 the fines are hefty on that so just wanted to set a perspective what we are dealing with before i go to the use case any questions any anything anyone wants to add this is more of a participative conversation so anything anyone wants to add about uh, you know what we just covered i think that say uh, unless you go for a real time system with uh, unique medical record and uh, um, smart uh, health care card this problem cannot be solved yeah jekar you are right uh, what we are about to talk is the real uh, real time uh, system as well uh, because there is if you look at the healthcare industry today uh, i don't know about the all the other countries but definitely united states there is no real point a real time touch point between a payer provider and a member these three are very critical to managing a member's health as yeah. well as um, you know any any such fraud detection and all and especially member being the center of this because all these transactions are tagged based on a member right so we will talk about that um um uh, you know in in how we are crafting the solution any other suggestions questions smart card also is asking no the thing is yeah okay yep thank you card then only that is it has to be updated each that is the prescription that conception will be updated from the prescription level and the that is the buying level yep cool uh um so let me just quickly cover the current state um you know uh, as it happens you know, a patient or a member would visit a physician you know right uh, physician usually ask you a question where do you want me uh, to send your prescription and you you give them a full filler you know a particular pharmacy a cs cvs Wal walgreens walmart whatever that you go to regularly right um you go there uh, and you sometimes find out either the medication is not there or let's say you are not in the city and you want to go uh, you know grab your prescription somewhere else usually the process is you will call, call back the physician office and you will request you know can you send my prescription to another place and this can happen also in um, you know for uh, you know uh, someone who is trying to game the system and wants to uh, you know get this prescription filled multiple times also i got the prescription from cvs i intentionally call the physician office can you forward it to the the, the other one i am not there um, you know at this location or something right physician office sends the prescription to another location right fulfiller the second fulfiller gets the prescription and they may fulfill your prescription so you know when i'm trying to game the system for multiple prescription same prescription from the same physician being filled multiple times there is a possibility to do that right um and then you know obviously fulfiller gives me the prescription both both the both the uh, pharmacies will file a claim depending upon how sophisticated the payer system is they may catch it they may not not catch it you don't know i mean the dollars are out the door now and usually what happens is this can this can continue i mean there is a possibility i am i am genuinely in need i need these prescriptions today i i may go to multiple fulfillers every time i change the fulfiller i will have to call my physician office to get it redirected or resent to another pharmacy so this is this is what goes on in current system today um now if you if you consider this this whole step 3 4 and 5 wherein i have to call make a call to the doctor doctor has to send it again or doctor office has to send it again to another uh, pharmacy it's usually a dissatisfy if i'm a genuine um you know member who is trying to get the prescriptions but at the same time uh, it's a it's a blessing for the someone who is trying to game the system and getting the prescription filled multiple times right so this is where this whole fraud you know can can pop up it can happen from pharmacy also it can happen from a member also uh, all sorts of 
you know possibilities of frauds are there so this is where we stand today now let me shift from a perspective instead of medications this is let's say a vision prescription wherein i want to get some glasses in that scenario this whole uh, idea of member wanting to change fulfiller is not because um, I, I i i want to game the system it may be because of convenience i went to one shop i did not get the uh, you know the the glasses that i want i didn't like all the options let me go to another one this happens today if you wear glasses i am pretty certain there is a possibility that you want to you want to have the flexibility what end event ends up uh, happening is i go to this shop i set my prescription there i'm going to be there and i may choose to make a compromise okay fine i i don't want to bother going somewhere else let me pick what what whatever is there but imagine if you had the flexibility to go to any fulfiller without your prior decision and you know get that done there itself that flexibility today does not exist in even in vision uh, you know prescription because if i have to go to another one i call my my you know uh, uh, eye doctor they have to release a prior or they have pulled on you so that another fulfiller can pull the prior or as well this happens and i think that these vision uh, pairs are trying to get away from this prior auth uh, but nonetheless it has not happened yet systems are still looking for the authorizations and you know uh, basically the flexibility to go from one fulfiller to another fulfiller by virtue of not tying to tying yourself to the physician or the eye doctor that can you send my prescription there so i can go get my uh, uh, my prescription or my medication in another location that flexibility is is tied to making a call to physician today you cannot just walk into another fulfiller and get this taken care of today so that's the current state the the previous one is more on medications this one is more you know customer convenience of can i pick my glasses from another location i see another you know um i i wear shop right next to it i want to go there but guess what my prescription is here how do i handle that you will have to make a call to your eye doctor to get the prescription sent to the other one as well that's what goes on today in current state let me just take a pause and and digest this information any questions so far uh this is kent i just want to add to ravish's point that this prescription can be for more than ocular glasses so for example with a prescription it's typically typically common that a pharmacy may not have the required let's say there were three items on the prescription you may have one and three and not have number two then what do you do so the prescription can either be filled with one and three or then can be released back to the patient so we need somehow not only to endorse what has been dispensed but also to actually uh reconcile what is owing to the patient thanks yep yep cool any other questions um hey ravish it's erica hi erica how are you good how are um, you good uh i just had i had a couple questions going back to the medication part um so where is there data on actual like pharmacy fraud cuz i know that pharmacists are usually pharmacies are usually pretty good about putting the medication back once it's dispensed if the patient doesn't pick it up and as well as keeping a pretty strict inventory among controlled substances so i was just wondering if that was i was surprised to hear that's actually an issue um in the united states at least uh i just i've worked in the pharmacy so much i've never heard of of data on that so i was curious about that um and then i also wanted to make a comment on the pharmacy shopping um it's definitely a problem it, it used to be a way bigger problem it still is a problem um but there are there are some safeguards safeguards in place especially if you're billing the same payer um uh there are you know it, it, the systems have gotten a little more sophisticated to kind of detect if someone's do, filling multiple like opioid prescriptions in one day the payers kind of will reject them um even if it's coming from different pharmacies so i just wanted to i just wanted to make a comment those comments yeah. 
Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, um, uh, Erica, the I, I'll probably send you some links, uh, maybe when the, uh, you know after the uh, call as well. There is some data that that talks about, and actually there is a there is a link that talks about all the, you know, uh, lawsuits against various pharmacies or or providers or, or so on and so forth. Some of this is on the pharmacy side is not intentional as well. It can happen unintentionally also. So it's not just you know uh, that pharmacy is trying to do something intentionally. And second thing is, you are absolutely right. The payer system has gotten sophisticated, but then there are still coordination of benefits when you have multiple insurances covering multiple things that become that is still a big issue today because then you are going cross payers so that's that's another um, you know issue that comes that comes and the other important thing i want want everyone to realize is a lot of large payers do not have uh, or, or work with another you know pharmacy benefit manager so for example you know there is a there is a company a which is healthcare payer there is a company B, which is the pharmacy management uh, benefits manager uh, management company. Their systems before they reconcile is 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 another. Uh, I mean, the, that's another big uh, undertaking as well. So there are some of these things, some of these issues that are cross, you know, organizations, if you will. If I have all the data with me at the same time, you know, and I'm managing everything, that's one thing. So there are complications still existing. Despite the pair systems have, um, uh, you know, become sophisticated, challenges are still there. Yeah, I agree. Um, a lot of the, I, I definitely agree with what you're saying. There's, there's until we get all on the same page with, like you said, a single point of real time connection between the pair provider and the patient, it's always going to be an issue. Um, yeah. uh, hi, this is Kent again. Uh, could I just uh, add one more point to Erica's? Uh, point of view is that uh, if the patient takes a prescription to the pharmacy, a lot of times if the pharmacy does not have that medication, the pharmacist will actually order in the medicine and then go on to dispense and label and prepare the correct medication. But if for whatever reason the patient takes that prescription away, then a pharmacist not only has done all the work necessary, but also has uh, gone out of his way to bring in the medication out of pocket, and then the patient walks away, then, you know, there are, with real time, you can actually compensate uh, all the relevant stakeholders and actors for what they've done appropriately. Yeah, I agree. It's really inefficient. Um, I've done that a million times, like filled a prescription or ordered something really expensive, and then it just sits there because the patient ended up getting it somewhere else or whatever. Um, it's certainly inefficient, but it does eventually get returned. And, you know, the, the patient, you know, if anything, the pharmacy is really the one who suffers in that case. Yeah, yeah that's what I mean. So, so in, a, in a way, the pharmacy has the, the worst of both ends. Thank you. I think that uh, uh, honoring the prescription has to be linked with that uh, medical record. So unless that is not there, that the, we cannot uh, how that the account all this. Uh, uh, I think Jikar, the, the definitely you can uh, link the prescription with the medical record. The problem is the medical record is at a provider uh, place. Payer does not have um, you know medical record you know, a lot of times, right? And at the same time, I mean, payer is is, uh, is paying your bills for the pharmacy, which is again, not connected to the provider system. So it's not as straightforward, uh, you know, to tie all these things together and all the efforts that we're talking about in the patient subgroup and all is creating that fluidity with the medical record as well. But nonetheless, I mean, the question is gonna be, pharmacy uh, or pharmacist should see only what is relevant to them and medical record may have other things in place as well. It just depends how, and I mean, there are a lot of laws that have to be kind of tweaked before, you know, all that fluidity happens. So just, um, just, just, you know, you know kind of uh, how the systems work in that sense. That's why that medical record has to be structured. It should not be just expressed. It has to be structured. And that you see, when that you from the card, you can, uh, update the uh, status of the uh, 
കൺസെപ്ഷൻ ആൻഡ് Porting across through blockchain is a very huge work. There is a lot of... Yeah. I, I, I think, Jekar, the, the patient subgroup is actually working on that medical... Uh, uh, I think... Uh, uh, Kent, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that sharing of medical records or is it just the clinical trials? No, that's... So, just to update you, uh, what we've done with the patient subgroup is that we've put some of the patient data on the blockchain, but... In order to pseudo anonymize or anonymize the patient, we are thinking about putting a hyperledger Aries in the sort of wallet for the distributed ID in front of the fabric chain in order to have patient there anonymize or pseudo anonymize and also have the data on the fabric chain as well. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, bottom line is going to be there will be multiple pieces that come together to solve each of, you know, various problems. Our focus in these US cases are how do we manage this particular flow, as we are talking about efficiently to avoid some of these, I would say mishaps, frauds, you know, uh, privacy, some of these things. So let's go to the blockchain viewpoint. I mean, the previous viewpoint were what is the current state and the way it is happening today. Let's talk about in, if we implement a blockchain uh, solution, what would it look like? So here the patient goes to a physician. Physician will send out the prescription somewhere in the, in the network. Uh, it is not going to go to a particular pharmacy or a particular eyewear doctor or, or um, you know, uh, eyewear fulfiller and all. It will just go right on the chain. Uh, what will happen is member will go to whichever choice of pharmacy or um, I would say the eyewear um, you know, shop and try to request for fulfillment. Fulfiller will request the consent real time by the member by virtue of either you know, a, a message coming to their phone or something like that. But before the data for the prescription is pulled by this fulfiller, right? It's going to request, you know, Ravish, give me your consent so I can pull your uh, information from the chain for uh, fulfilling the request. In this case, I don't need to go call back the physician. I just need to approve. Yes, this particular organization is asking um, or requesting the access to my, you know, prescription. Let me grant that request or uh, I would say consent to it. Fulfiller gets the consent. This is recorded as well. Uh, you know, I've got the consent. I got pulled out the prescription. Fulfiller pulls the prescription out, fills the prescription, or I would say service the prescription in whether completely or partially, as Kent mentioned. There is a scenario that, you know, out of three, I only have two. Let me fulfill two. One is still pending. Whatever fulfillment was done by the pharmacist can be recorded there in context of that particular prescription. So there is a there is prescription one, what I've done with the prescription one, you know, great. And once the endorsement is done, this is what has been fulfilled fully or partially, it gets written back to the chain. What is going to happen is if this member tries to refill this prescription anywhere other location, the, the prescription will come as fulfilled by some other pharmacy, partially or fully, whichever be the case, even though the member gives consent to that second pharmacy as well, which means in a given context, that prescription will be fulfilled only by a, uh, only by a single, um, you know, uh, pharmacy. If if the uh, if the prescription was fully filled or partially filled, it will be accordingly endorsed. And there is a possibility I may want to revoke the consent, you know, after this transaction. So every time. I, I should be consenting every time or consenting whenever I'm trying to fill, which is again, will lead to a real time notification to me. Somebody is pulling my prescription information and they need my permission to do that. This addresses number of use cases. Does this address all the use cases? Absolutely not. This is just the initial thought process of how we can create the flexibility. So imagine in the same scenario, um, this has happened to be an eyewear 
um, use case, I can really go to any shop I want. I go there, consent, they don't have what I need, revoke the consent, go to another one. And if one fulfilled, the other one cannot fulfill that prescription anymore. Right? Uh, and again, in, in this whole process, what we're trying to do is avoid number of fraud use cases, uh, refilling the same prescription and things like that. Also, um, real time information to me as a member or a patient, somebody trying to pull my record out and they need my consent to do that. Which means I am, I'm always dealing with the real time information, if you will. And as I said earlier, member has to be a key player in catching some of these things because these transactions, whether it is prescription or a physician visit or a, you know, hospital visits are all going to be tagged by a member and sent to the pair. If member is not able to validate some of these things, or if member becomes a critical element to provide consent at real time, we can avoid some of these mishaps that happen. Them It may not be from member, but identity theft and, and I can restrict that. Second, on from behavioral perspective, you know, prescription, prescription is going to be only filled once now and coordinated across any number of pharmacies. So these are just a few highlights how we can look at it differently and leverage the blockchain. Again, it's a very simple view. As I said earlier, you know, Erica, you, you've been in this. There are a lot of you know, peripheral use cases. The same thing happens on the DME uh, side as well, wherein you know, the medical equipment um, uh, you know, get, get sent to the member's home and all. All sorts of use cases exist. You just pick one, which is pharmacy and, and kind of a viewpoint wherein it makes it simple to understand what we are talking about from, from blockchain standpoint. I'll just take a pause, take any questions or, or Kent or PSB or anyone, anything to add. Another thing uh, you can integrate is a cyber physical system. So many IoT devices and including wearables that is, that is specific for a particular disease that can monitor the consumption of the <laughs> drug and that is update in the medical record. So that, that misuse can be Reduce. But it yeah, that, time. It, uh, that's a possibility. But it, yep. evolving on such system is uh, it will take some time. There is a lot of collaborative effort is needed. Yep. It's, in healthcare, any such change because of the nature of the business and so many different you know constituent types who are in in, in the flow it takes time to change healthcare. It is not as easy as it is thought through. Exactly. Even if I have this perfectly working fine and, and rock and roll, changing or adopting that into the healthcare system, it is not easy. And I will not be surprised if making this happen requires some tweaking to the laws. It is absolute, I will not be absolutely surprised. But any, any other, the things are moving in that direction. Yep, yep. Hey, I have another question about the partial fill. Um, mm -hmm. I was just curious where the need in the market for, you know, um, showing the partial fill is, because I, I know as a pharmacist, we have a pretty good way of showing that those prescriptions were filled on that prescription, um, even if there's one left over. Uh, it's not like the patient can just take that and go get the other ones filled that are on there. Um, so I'm just wondering where that need comes from or what the market need for that is. Perhaps I can take that question. So yep. I think uh, you'll realize that if you fill half the prescription, then you're never going to let go of that prescription. Whatever happens, the patient has to come back to you to get the other half or whatever is remaining. Now that's very inefficient for the patient. The patients always complain. They never want to wait. They don't care about the cost. They want it right now. So imagine there were two pharmacists next door to each other. Pharmacist A can never fill half and they give a prescription to pharmacist B, right? Because you need to keep the original copy, all the laws, all the reimbursements. It depends on the, on the level of control of the prescription. Yeah, but you, you follow my point there. This is the actual paper, paper copy versus digital copy, and then yeah, actually... they, we make right. So a digital copy is created when we write the prescription, and then we there's ways around that that they do um, 
if it's a, it's permitted to make copies of prescriptions if they're not controlled. If you keep one copy, you give the patient the other copy, you cross off the ones that you filled. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. It's, I, I'm not trying to pick it, pick it apart. I'm just saying that I, I'm just trying to make sure we've thought through the market need of this. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the inefficiency and, part I get, the inefficiency part I totally get, it's the fraud part that I don't really get. Um, but the inefficiency yeah. part is totally understandable from my, from my point of view. And Erica, I mean, the, uh, I think the, uh, this is something that uh, Kent was uh, explaining earlier also, and I am not a pharmacist, so I may not be able to answer this, but uh, what I am thinking is this, what you're describing might not be common in US, but it can be in other countries, uh, depending upon where you are. The intent is how do we figure out the endorsement, whether it's partial or full. If we, even if we, are, if we are doing a full endorsement, okay, this pharmacy is filling the prescription, I have the flexibility to do it full or half. It doesn't matter, you know, from system perspective. Yes, from, from process perspective, I understand your viewpoint that is there really a need to, to manage the partial prescription? There may be not in, in, in the con in context of US, but there might be in context of some other countries' workflows and mechanics and whatnot. Nonetheless, if we are managing that, uh, you know, whether this prescription were, was filled or not, or fulfilled or not, then we can manage even the partial piece as well. So from technical standpoint, so that's, that's just- Perhaps I can just process. add one more thing. So for example, quite often the, the doctor, medical doctor will prescribe uh, one calendar month. Okay, so it's up to the pharmacist to decide whether it is a 28 days or 30 days or 31 days. So very often the medicine comes in a 28 tablet pack. We give one original 28 tablet pack However, the patient is always lacking at least one or two or three tablets. And so we can never give medicine without a prescription because, first of all, it's illegal and then no one pays for it. And the flip side is, if we give 31 days for every single prescription, then there's always something left over and the patient always has extra tablets for no reason. So it's about reconciliation. I think. Yeah, and I appreciate that it's probably a bigger problem outside the U.S., but we have we have systems that account for the 28 versus 31 days here, um, and ways of uh, ways of doing that pretty pretty seamlessly. Um, but yeah, uh, and and we we it, so yeah, I, I totally hear what you guys are saying. Um, I just wanted to give you my feedback, so thank you, Erica. Something tells me you will be a great addition to our group. <laughs> Definitely, I agree. Erica has to be has to come to our group. I insist. Thank you, Erica. And and also revision. I think one uh, good point you made is that you know there are so many uh, different uh, use cases. I think we are not only trying to, in this group. We are not only trying to just solve a real healthcare problem, but we are also trying to create a, a use case. You know, for uh, a, for blockchain that can become a basis for like you know, expanding the use cases to other areas. So you know, I think yeah. I think that's the. Just an important uh, dis you know, distinction we need to make as far as our um, you know creativity here is concerned. Yep. So, Erica, I mean, I would really request you, uh, you know, personally, if you if you can join our meetings, that will be great value add. Uh, I mean, everything is online as well, um, and I'll show you. We 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 have started a use case document. You know, challenging some of those use cases is something that would be very valuable for uh, to us to ensure that we are not solving for something that is not needed. Um, and, and this is where the SME knowledge comes into picture as well. I think the supply chain also has to be modified. It, that the drug delivery has to be, let us say, to that bedside of the patient. Let us say, uh, it has to reach the bedside of the patient. That is the so that so that the fragmented, uh, that prescription ha can be handled in fragmented in the, the supply. That is a yep. going to a pharmacy and getting medicine. It has to be delivered to that uh, that side. Yeah, Jika. I mean, the, the 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 delivery aspect is also there. I mean, it's just uh, yeah. The, there are so many use cases. We cannot. We have to start at a point, simplified, and then start adding those layers. You know, like uh, what Erica is talking about, like what you're talking about. Absolutely. As we go forward, we we have to look into some of those things. So just uh, quickly sharing the viewpoint wherein, um, as we think about the blockchain, we, are th we have thought about four major uh, players 
in this particular use case. Um, obviously, there will be many players, but to start with, uh, with this particular use case, the POC that we are building is going to be around a provider as a participant, a payer as a participant, patients, and pharmacy. And you can see what data that we are trying to deal with uh, when it comes to um, you know, writing to the blockchain or reading from the blockchain. Um, as I mentioned, there are too many questions to be answered yet. Uh, who will run these nodes? Will it be a payer, provider, pharmacy? Who's going to who is going to run those you know nodes? What all data should be on the chain and off the chain? How to manage the identity? Will it be a single identity across various pairs or a different identity across different pairs? You know, consent should be per transaction or one time but revocable. I mean, all these questions are there. I mean, should we retrieve all the um, uh, should we alert based on all retrievals of prescription or should it be based on, you know, my, uh, I want to, I, I usually go to this pharmacy, but if there is a pull of my prescription by any other pharmacy, I should know. So it depends what kind of alerts we need. Uh, we talked about partial fulfillment or, uh, you know, complete fulfillment, how to handle coordination of benefits. You know, if there are multiple pairs, if I have insurance or supplementary insurance, you know, between the pairs for the same medication, I may be able to bill both of them before it, you know, I, it gets reconciled across the pairs with the coordination of benefits. You may have, you know, the fraud might have happened. So there are those scenarios. Uh, again, there are plenty of other questions to be answered, but the intent is, you know, just demonstrating that we are just in the beginning step. Uh, there might be a lot of refinement to the use case that we just talked about. And that's where we are looking for you know, help and advice and, and, you know, like uh, Erica, you mentioned about the partial fulfillment might not be a significant use case. Um, uh, as we, you know, do the analysis, we may find out, okay, great. We can look into it later on, but the priority is to look at something else first. So th those things are there. I think um, I'm sorry, someone. Yeah, I, th I think most of the, this problem can be solved if that the supply chain is modified so that the uh, online pharmacy has to be delivered uh, at the, up to the best side. Because most of the opiates that the uh, medicines are that is for that uh, sick, more, more sickly patients, the bystanders, yes. when they go for a pharmacy, they will misuse that. So it has to reach the uh, patient's best side. Uh, that is the I think that. Yeah. Jekar, uh, as I said earlier, there are there are layers that we need to work through. Um, yes, you are right. I mean, there are, you know, it can be done at the supply chain. Uh, supply chain has to do their bit. Pharmacy has to do their bit. Payer has to do their. Provider has to do their. So there are a lot of these peripheral things as well. And, you know, healthcare is like, you know, a web. You know, you talk about one thing before you realize you are, you have to touch 50 other things at the same time. So definitely I, I, I understand what you're saying, but Yes, there is there is complexity in the use case itself. Yeah, I mean the supply chain in the end user level. That's Understood. I mean, uh, obviously, I mean that can happen. Um, I mean, uh, are you talking about when, let's say, a pharmacy is delivering something to yeah, exactly. to some patient? Yeah, even yeah. some diversion can happen there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they, the, somebody um, that is prescription, they take the prescription and go to their pharmacy. They yeah. It yep. has to the <laughs> Yep. Cool. So just to quickly summarize, as I mentioned, there is a use case document that you're working on. Uh, if you, it's available online. Uh, the link is there. You can, anyone can go and edit it. Uh, uh, it's on the Hyperledger repository. What we have done is we are trying to detail it based on, uh, let me just quickly show you guys. Um, the use cases, I mean, what is happening at the provider level? <clears throat> um, and based on that, what can we use uh, as a solution? So for example, consent, we can use that. You know, for example, even provider should require a consent by the member to write this on the blockchain, right? So uh, so those, those pieces of use cases, we are trying to describe here and we're working through this. Um, Erica, I would love for you to take a look at it and make sure that we are working on real things uh, since since you've been in the industry and and you can easily point out some of these things 
and uh, and obviously i mean uh, we also have uh, i'm sorry i think you were you guys were not uh, give me one second let me just share my screen i was i don't know whether you had a chance to look at the document that i was talking about so um can you guys see my screen do you see a, a word document yep. Yep, looks good. Okay, cool. So here we have uh, the use cases, as I mentioned, documented. What are the scenario? Who are the actors? So on and so forth. Uh, at the at the provider office, at the pharmacy office, um, and depending on that, we are detailing what else is needed um, for each step, if you will. And then obviously, uh, uh, the GitHub repo is there. You can uh, you can see the initial. Uh, we just started with some basics. I mean, initial commit has been made by Kent, and I think all the other members are going to be will start contributing, and we'll we plan to build a small um, you know prototype wherein you know provider can submit this prescription when pharmacist tries to pull some notification to the member, member gives the consent, they are able to fulfill and mark the prescription fulfilled. Now, if you try to pull it from another pharmacy, it will indicate it has been fulfilled and things like that. I think I have covered most of the items. Um, um, anything else, uh, Ken, ESB, anything else to add? Rich, I think I'm, I've covered most of the things. Again, uh, thank you very much for listening. I, I, I hope uh, it gave a good idea of what exactly we are working on. Um, and would welcome any inputs, anyone to join the team and, and see if they can contribute. Especially I would request, um, you know, anyone who has the pharmacy, uh, uh, you know, knowledge or how the system works would be a great addition. Erica, like you, I mean, it would be a great addition to the conversation. And we can- Yeah, I just, I just sent you a, I sent you a message on the chat, Ravish. Thank you, though, sure. for the presentation. It's great. And uh, we do have a request if you can put the uh, the use case document link up on uh, on chat so folks can get to it. That would be great. Yes, I'll do that. Well, uh, thank you so much, Ravish. This, this was a really great presentation, uh, and I particularly enjoyed the the discussion and some of the good questions that came out of it. Um, and it, it really does sound like you're, you're moving forward, you're maturing the, the use cases uh, pretty significantly. Uh, and again, I'm really happy to see that uh, we're getting this work uh, sort of uh, documented through the subgroup as well as up on uh, Hyperledger Labs. So that's fantastic. Uh, kudos to both yourself and, and your team. Uh, this is really, really nice to see this work coming together. So thank you so much for that. Um, any questions or comments uh, before we close out? We are just a minute or two uh, up to the top of the hour. Uh, any last minute thoughts? Alrighty, well, so just a quick reminder, of course, uh, we are still dealing with the COVID virus uh, and on our wiki page, there are, uh, it continues to be additional sort of resources that I maintain and update. Uh, please please take, uh, take advantage of uh, those resources uh, to stay up to date on any work uh, that you may be doing in that space. Uh, and then as well, uh, in general, please uh, stay safe yourself. Uh, this is uh, getting to be a very difficult time. I think uh, certainly here in the United States, we're starting to see an upsurge again in, uh, in viruses uh, in virus cases. And so just a uh, just reminder that uh, um, the virus isn't very discriminatory and so it just will continue to, to progress unless we uh, sort of take it into our own hands. Uh, alrighty, well, uh, we will see you in two weeks and uh, thanks again uh, to Ravish and, uh, Ravish and team uh, for uh, Pair subgroup and uh, we will see you. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend and again, be safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, everybody.